Running on Air by Eleventy Seven Chapter Thirteen As morning rolls across the sky, Draco suggests to driving to Brighton, but Harry pleads exhaustion and they check in at a local bed and breakfast. The receptionist, an elderly woman, who types with only one finger, one painful letter at a time, can't seem to stop staring at them. Harry is suddenly aware of his rumpled robes. Are you together? The receptionist asks. No, Harry says. Yes, Draco says. The receptionist pauses. Yes, Draco repeats firmly and the woman nods, turning back to the computer. She meant if we're paying together, Potter. Draco mutters to Harry. Well, we're not, Harry says, slightly embarrassed by trying to cover his error. Oh, I've got some muggle money on me. Don't be stupid. I've got my card. I'm paying. Harry subsides into, if he's honest with himself, a sock. Draco pays for two rooms and makes the fatal mistake of inquiring about the East Coastal walking track. The woman immediately launches into an enthusiastic, if one-sided, conversation about the local flora and fauna. Draco manages to politely extract himself fifty minutes later and they make their escape to their rooms. Draco's directly across the hallway, Harry notes, as he unlocks his own door to reveal a spacious and neatly presented room. There's an excellent ocean view, but he's too tired to appreciate it. Oh, I'm having a nap, he tells Draco, half expecting him to say he's going for a walk. But Draco just nods and unlocks his own room, disappearing inside. Harry shuts his door, crosses to the bed, and collapses up on it. Within minutes, he's asleep. They explore the cliffs the next day. The lighthouse, Harry learns, is called South Foreland Lighthouse. The lighthouse went out of service in 1988 and has been converted to a small museum, meant by an elderly guide. Draco lingers over a wall-mounted diagram of the electric light and is accosted by the guide, who lectures with enthusiasm onto Draco's apparent interest and proceeds to deliver a 50-minute lecture on carbon arc lamp. Harry, though greatly amused, takes pity on Draco and rescues him. We should get going, he says, walking over to Draco and tilting his head towards the door. Yes, quite, Draco says casually, though there is a hint of gratitude in his voice, and he politely nods at the guide before retreating hastily. Once they're safely out of earshot, Harry starts laughing and Draco frowns. They always do that, he says, looking peeved. Always. I'll be standing there minding my own business and they'll come up to me and start chatting away. It's maddening. How awful, Harry teases. People being nice to you. How do you put up with it? Very funny, Potter. Draco turns onto the coastal walking track. My father was quite masterful at appearing cold and aloof, discouraging anybody approaching. I rather hoped to have a similar effect on people. Harry pauses to study him. You don't, you know. Quite surprising, really, but you don't. It's true, he thinks. Strange. In school, Draco always gets off that cold air. But now... Sometimes he seems distant, but in a different way. Whether he's gazing silently at lighthouses or standing patiently in an inn's reception, he seems the sort of person who might not be a good conversationist, but certainly a good listener. He tells Draco that. You're a good listener. People like that. Draco doesn't seem to know how to respond to that, but Harry catches the faint flush in his face. They drive to Brighton. They stop in Hopper's Crossing, a small wizarding community, at Harry's request. Keen to avoid slack-jawed gazes and awestruck expressions, Harry uses a quick charm to change his hair color and lengthen it slightly, covering his scar. It's not a particularly genuine effort, but it will work well enough. People won't be expecting to see him here anyway, and Harry's learned that people often see only what they expect to see. He converts some galleons to muggle money at a local exchange, then visits the stationery shop for some parchment and ever-inking quill. Draco, who has long since vanished into a nearby clothing store, 
reappears with a frown and an armful of bags. What are you doing? Writing to my friends. I don't want him to worry. Draco's frown deepens. Harry, guessing at his concerns, adds, I won't mention you at all. He shoves the letter towards Draco. He's kept it short and succinct, telling Hermione and Ron that he felt like a short break. He's gone away for a short trip. He's completely fine and looks forward to seeing them again soon. Draco reads the letter once, twice, three times before he speaks quietly. You can say I'm with you. Now it's Harry's turn to hesitate. It's all right, Draco says. It's fine. Harry lifts the quill and writes a postscript. P.S. Draco's with me. We're both perfectly all right. Five minutes later, Harry watches a hawk all fly out from the owlery, the wings spread against the blue sky. Faint outline of a letter upon its leg as it disappears into the distance. Later, when they're back on the road and on their way to Brighton again, Draco says he should return to the manor. My mother will be worrying, he says. Harry switches the indicator on and overtakes a car in front. Hermione and Ron will tell her they got the letter. She'll know you're all right. Draco glances out the window, watching the scenery flash past. I should return, he says. I have obligations. My mother has organized several social functions for me to attend, and Astoria wants me to meet with the solicitor. Forget your obligations. That gets Draco's attention. He turns to stare at Harry. What? Forget your obligations? Harry repeats. You're not going back because you need to attend whatever social affairs Narcissa has organized or because Astoria has made appointments. I remember what you said to me once. What's the point in sitting in a box going only where other people take you? It's the reason you left, and it will be the reason you leave again. Draco is still staring at Harry. I never said that to you, he says at last. Harry frowns. What? I never said what's the point sitting in a box to you. I said it to Astoria. You just saw it in a memory. Harry laughs incredulously. That's what you take away from this conversation. God, Malfoy, you can be so... He shakes his head. Draco doesn't deign to reply to that, but when Harry glances at him five minutes later, he can see that Draco is smiling. What? Harry asks. What? What are you smiling at? Nothing. They lapse into silence again, but twenty minutes later, as they're halfway across a bridge over the river Oz, Draco speaks again, not lifting his gaze from the window. You're far too knowledgeable about me, Potter. Harry hides a smile. They arrive in Brighton. Harry, sick of transfiguring items into toothbrushes and combs, goes to the nearest chemist. Draco, despite his familiarity with cars and petrol stations, seems fascinated with the many items available, and Harry has to drag him away from the bottles of cough syrup. They're just like pepper-up potions, Harry says. They most certainly are not. They use lace wings and beetle eyes. They use... Draco tilts his hat, staring at the label. Dextro Metherfan. Yes, well, no doubt muggles would be equally horrified to learn that we ingest insect parts. Everybody ingests insects. The average chocolate bar has eight insect legs in it. What? That is complete rubbish. The process of harvesting cocoa beans means that insects are inevitably present. Trying to produce completely insect-free chocolate is far too expensive. Harry looks down at a double-decker in his hand and considers putting it back. Then again, if Draco is telling the truth, there's bits of insects in every chocolate. Want one? He asks instead, holding up the double-decker with a hint of challenge in his voice. Why not? Draco says, returning the challenge with a raised eyebrow. 
They pay for their items, or at least Draco pays with his card. Harry feels a little uncomfortable about Draco paying for everything so far. But Draco doesn't seem to care, and he hasn't made Harry feel like he owes him anything. Where did you learn that about chocolate anyway? Harry asks later, when they're wandering past the Royal Pavilion. Drove to Birmingham and went to Cadbury World. Harry laughs. You went to Cadbury World? Here I was, thinking you did very serious and soul-searching road trips all over Britain. You try finding something to do in Birmingham, Draco retorts. It's a mild summer day. The domes and onion-shaped minarets of the Royal Pavilion opens into the sky, shining white in the light afternoon sun, and guns stretch away from the buildings in lush sprawls of verdant green. Harry wouldn't mind staying a while. They go to a cafe for lunch. Harry considers the day's specials. Draco quickly puts a stop to that. You do know that the special is usually food that's about to expire. They're desperate to get rid of it. You do know, Harry retorts, that you're systematically destroying everything I used to enjoy about food. Insects and chocolate, now this. And yet you won't change your choices. It's not intended as an insult, Harry thinks, judging by the tone of Draco's voice and the way he shrugs afterwards. Merely a casual observation. He thinks about it all through the meal, though. People make bad choices. People become informed. People continue to make bad choices despite being informed. He wonders at what point Draco's loyalty to Voldemort became an informed choice. Harry insists on visiting the beach before they leave. When I was a child, he says, everyone I knew went to Brighton for the beaches. And now... He finally has his chance. Draco doesn't seem too enthusiastic, but he doesn't outright argue as Harry finds his way to the pier. The beachfront area is filled with confused tourists, irritated locals, and cafes with loud music. The beach itself is crowded with families. School holidays, Harry remembers. There's far too many children shrieking and kicking sand about. It's crowded. He observes at last, looking out over the sea of sunburnt noses and pasty legs. It's Brighton. Harry had been expecting a triumphant I told you so. Something smug, something irritating. But that smug Draco was long ago washed away by war and weariness. Do you remember when we were eleven? Let's go back to that. But Harry is happy to leave the past where it is. Later that evening, they drive on to Southampton. It's a two-hour drive. Harry, who is the navigator for the journey, takes a direct route. He wonders if Draco would prefer the scenic and meandering side roads, as he usually does, but Draco doesn't say anything about Harry's choice of road. They speed along the M27, Draco as confident as ever. In the hazy light of the summer dusk, a fox darts across the road and Draco swerves neatly around it. They arrive in Southampton at 8.30, the sun setting over the city, but Draco doesn't seem inclined to remain here. Harry mentions that observation and Draco shrugs. Oh, I've been here before. They stop at a level crossing, the gates swinging closed, the red warning bell blinking like a beacon in the night. As they wait for the train to come through, Draco's eyes flick to the rear vision mirror. This is real, he says. Harry pauses. Draco's voice lilted at the end, morphing the statement into an uncertain half-question. You don't think it is? he asks carefully. I don't know. Draco glances away from the mirror, his gaze locking onto Harry instead. I have difficulties sometimes, telling the difference between dreams and memories and reality. Then you tell the healers, Harry wants to ask, but he bites back the urge. No, 
Of course, Draco didn't tell the healers. He wouldn't have let him leave. No, of course he didn't tell his mother. She's clinging to the mask of normalcy. No, he's only told Harry. And Harry knows that's important. Look, he says, reaching for Draco's hand. Draco looks startled, but doesn't pull away when Harry wraps his hand around Draco's. When you were trapped in time, we couldn't make contact, could we? So, this must be real. Draco looks at Harry, then glances down at their linked hats. You've got a scar, Draco observes, and Harry, surprised, follows Draco's gaze. The streetlight faintly shines silver on Harry's skin, picking out the thread of letters. I must not tell lies. So have you, Harry says, disentangling his hands slightly to brush a fingertip over the faded curve of a serpent's tail. The train rushes through, roaring along, the carriages clicking over the rails with precise repetition. Draco stares ahead, and Harry's wondering if he's counting carriages. The last carriage rushes through, and soon the dark line of the train has disappeared around the curve of the way. The warning bell abruptly stops its constant noise. The red light flickers and dies. Draco pulls his hand away, takes the handbrake off as the crossing gate rises and drives over the tracks. The headlights dip for a moment before illuminating the endless stretch of asphalt again. They stop for the night in Bournemouth. After they've found a suitable bed and breakfast and booked their respective rooms, Draco asks Harry if he's going to tell the healers. Tell them what? Harry asks, walking slowly along the hallway as he searches for his room number. Even Draco's newfound patience has its limits, apparently. Gives Harry an irritated look, and Harry suddenly remembers. Reality and memories melting together and falling apart like sand thrown into the sky. No, he says. I mean, it's not any of my business, is it? My mother would worry endlessly if she found out. Well, don't tell her then, Harry says, arriving at his door. Draco looks at him, opens his mouth then evidently changes his mind and closes his mouth again. See you tomorrow, he says instead. Tomorrow? Harry echoes, opening the door and stepping inside. He closes the door behind himself and looks across the dark, empty room. He dreams that night of rain beating a dark tattoo across the skin of the land. <laughs>